Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to welcome all of you um, and our distinguished guest today, uh, Zaid Rad El Hussein, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, to the inaugural Mord and Shepi Abramowitz lecture. Um, the purpose of this lecture series, which is made possible by the generous support of the Abramowitz family, is to try to highlight what all of you know very well, and that's the continuing significance of humanitarian and human rights issues on a very crowded and complicated international landscape. Uh, I can't think of a moment when it's more important to focus on those issues. Uh, as all of you know very well, this is a moment uh, when the space for civil society, for humanitarian and human rights activism is increasingly being closed in many places around the world where intolerance um, is threatening pluralism and respect for diversity where oftentimes authoritarian systems seem to be on the rise and gaining momentum and democracies seem embattled uh, and dysfunctional and challenged by governance. Um, it's a moment when increasing attacks on independent media and fake news are crowding out uh, debate and honest fact-based discussion of issues. I also can't think of uh, two people uh, who, whose professional lives have uh, better embodied the importance of those issues than Mort and Sheppy. I promise not to embarrass them with a long recitation of their accomplishments, but I would say simply um, that you've made an enormous positive impact on many of us in this room and on many, many people beyond this room. Um, Mord, in 40 years um, as an extraordinary diplomat, was a role model for my generation. He's been a role model uh, as a former president of the Carnegie Endowment um, and as the initiator of a number of wonderful initiatives like the International Crisis Group. And Sheppy has made her own indelible mark um, as a human rights worker, um, as a humanitarian activist, and as a wonderful mentor to generations of public servants in the Refugee Affairs Bureau at the State Department. So it's really an honor to have both of you with us today and to launch this series in your name. So thank you. And finally, um, I can't think of a, a person um, who's better position to serve as the inaugural speaker uh, for this lecture series um, than our distinguished guest today, Zaid Rad El Hussein. Uh, many of you know his exemplary career. Um, he's now been the UN High Commissioner, a nice easy job, um, for about three years. But before that, served two different stints as Jordan's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, was, did a terrific job as Jordan's ambassador in Washington to the United States and in a variety of senior roles in multilateral diplomacy, played extraordinarily important roles in everything from peacekeeping and the Balkans to the creation of the International Criminal Court. But beyond all of, because he's a friend and, and diplomatic colleague of many years, I, I would add that beyond all of that professional skill and accomplishment, what has always set Zaid apart has been his decency and his integrity and his humanity. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and it's especially kind of you to do this at the beginning of General Assembly Week, which I often remember as diplomatic speed dating, um, um, but which I know is a huge uh, drain on your time and agenda. So thank you very much again. What I'll do is get the conversation started over the next few minutes, but I promise I'll leave plenty of time for your questions and a more open discussion. But say, let me just start um, by showing that I've retained the you know, American diplomat's capacity to restate the blindingly obvious, and that is that <laughs> it's not easy to be the uh, public face of human rights at the United Nations. And I imagine it's particularly difficult when you come from a part of the world, most of whose leaderships at least are not noted for their attachment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, and you've put it very politely, uh, Bill, because others will say, who on earth do you think you are to be lecturing to the European Union uh, membership or to be lecturing to the United States or Canada or Australia? I mean, 
you know, where do you think you come from, as you said, but they do so less politely. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the obvious response is that um, you have to judge someone on their conduct and over the basis or over the uh, a time period where it's quite clear where their passions are, where their convictions lay. Um, but to make determinations on who is acceptable for whatever position on the basis of uh, race, color, ethnicity, uh, sexual preference is something that we try and eschew, of course, in the human rights community. Um, and so it, it behooves us to be uh, fair and firm on everyone, not least because uh, those uh, countries that have long stood sentinel uh, over uh, human rights, that uh, have played a part in the drafting of the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, need themselves to hold uh, and maintain a very high standard of conduct. And when they don't, uh, then others, of course, run riots when it comes to their own obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis their own people. Um, and so, yes, uh, I, I do hear the flag, uh, and yes, the Arab world, sadly, and I think uh, all of the Arab diplomats in this audience would agree, pro probably more in private than in public, uh, that uh, there are many deficits that we need to uh, adjust for in the Arab world. I mean, not least we have the, these horrific conflicts uh, that must be brought to an end quickly. Thanks, Sid. I mean, one of the um a different question, I guess, is one of the um, few remaining um, bipartisan habits in Washington these days is criticism of the Human Rights Council, yeah. um, some of whose members are pretty <laughs> egregious violators of human rights, oftentimes look like arsonists posing as firemen in the Human Rights Council. Um, can you talk a little bit about the distinction between the work of the council, your work as a commissioner, and I know you've spoken about this publicly, but any ideas that you have to help improve not just the image, but the effectiveness of the Human Rights Council? Yeah. No, it, it has long been battered uh, by uh, many who rightly point out that some of the most uh, terrible violators of human rights are elected onto the body. Uh, and uh, it makes mockery of any attempt to abide by the General Assembly uh, resolution that set it up, which requires the members, the 47 members of the Human Rights Council, to uphold the highest standards of human rights. And uh, uh, the obvious uh, sort of response that one will hear when one says, you know, only those with relatively pristine records should be represented, is that uh, you will, people will say, well, then you'll just have a, you know, it'll be a, a council of Scandinavian countries, basically. Um, and that there is, there is something to be gained when you have other countries with problematic human rights records on board. And they, they agree to a, a particular resolution in respect of another situation, which then at least you hope would put pressure on them to clean up uh, and sort out their own obligations inside their own state. It, it doesn't always work because, Bill, there are two things that we have to bear in mind. One is that the entire international system is held together by a, a fading memory now. I'd say by memory, but it's fading, and that's why we see the attacks on the system, whether it be the security system, the, uh, the financial, uh, international financial architecture, or the rights-based system. Um, and uh, in that, we have to be extremely careful that we don't uh, lose sight of the antecedents that led to these, the creation of, of uh, these three uh, main bodies. Um, and the other point I was just about to raise, and it just skipped my mind, so I'm going to have to come back to it. It shows you that uh, we human rights people are entirely fallible and make uh, <laughs> I'll get, to, uh, get back to join, it in a second. Join the crowd. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, it'll, it'll, you'll have to ask me another All question, right. I'll cut to that. All right. Yeah. No, well, the, the other question actually follows from that a little bit, and that is that, you know, you've highlighted many times in public, and you just alluded to this, the kind of internal, external challenge, you know, the behavior, the internal behavior of certain leaderships and governments doesn't match up to their external preaching. And, you know, we're meeting today at a moment when in the U.S. White House and the administration, you know, you have a leadership that at least so far has contained its enthusiasm um, for humanitarian and human rights advocacy, at least on a number of issues. 
Um, what, what kind of international impact um, do you think that has? How important is the power of example in the United yeah. States? But I, I, I spoke of this two weeks ago in a press conference when I was asked uh, a question uh, which begged the response similar to this. I was very concerned about the president's comments uh, in Arizona uh, soon after the events in Charlottesville, uh, where he was singling out the media once again for criticisms. And one understands fully well that the United States, a uh, country where uh, the protection of the press, the protection of, uh, of free speech is guaranteed under the Constitution. The, the danger that we always perceive is that uh, once you start to uh, berate the press, single out individual journalists, uh, sort of a, a climate of intimidation begins to take hold. You then see self-censorship. And even though there are constitutional guarantees, uh, we, you begin to see a sort of a, a, a almost a, a reduced climate of tolerance for uh, the media to express itself. And then were there to be attacks on individual journalists, it goes even beyond that. Um, and when making these comments, I pointed out that soon after the president's remarks, uh, he was cited by the Cambodian leadership uh, when they themselves revoked the licenses of various uh, radio stations and media outlets in Phnom Penh. And it's this radiation which uh, worries us uh, intensely. I mean, yes, we are concerned about what may happen in the US, uh, but the multiplier effect elsewhere is very noticeable. And one also, uh, you know, watching Aung San Suu Kyi um, uh, make her initial remarks about the military operations in northern Rakhine. And uh, she dismissed the uh, reports from my office and others as fake news. And, and this clearly cannot be uh, something that helps the human rights agenda uh, writ large. Um, and so there is an importance that we attach to what it is that the president says uh, or fails to say. And uh, what left us concerned also after the uh, uh, results of the 8th of November uh, is that uh, traditionally, I think ever since 1948, you've had a bipartisan approach toward the maintenance of, of values with some administrations more passionate about it than others. But never have you seen a, a sort of jettisoning of the, entire, um, of the entire human rights agenda. And what we've seen now is that there is a sort of a movement back, at least on certain files, which I think is, is healthy. And on the Rohingya crisis, we see the US being now more vocal about the need to prevent this crisis from getting worse, which is encouraging. Uh, but on other issues, of course, uh, we're still uh, waiting to hear or, or very concerned about a sort of absence of a voice uh, from the US. Having a hard time getting in my mind the image of Hun Sen as a Twitter follower, but um, I, I, I did want to ask. So, on since you raised the, the situation in Rakhine and the plight of the Rohingya, um, what what can be done at this point? I mean, I've seen the reports that you've put out, which are very direct and very candid um, in their criticism and their analysis of the situation. But what what can be done at this stage? Yeah. Do you think? Well, it's important, I think, today to see what it is. I, I haven't seen any reports about her statement. Actually, it's tomorrow. It's on mm -hmm. Tuesday. I understand her statement may be uh, in English, which itself may tell us something, uh, maybe not directed at her own people uh, as such. Uh, the other thing is that I would hope to see that uh, she isn't simply the spokesperson of the military. Uh, that uh, she is speaking in terms which are deep in their compassion, which we hope, in respect of the Rohingya, she is capable of, of expressing uh, and uh, creating some distance between her and the military. And as a uh, Burmese friend told me yesterday, uh, the important thing is also to see whether or not the military will accept returns that will restore the balance in Northern Rakhine, a sort of nine to one balance, uh, Rohingya versus the Rakhine minority. If the military refuse to accept the large numbers from returning, then this just confirms to us that this was a very deliberate 
uh, maneuver to remove a large percentage of the Rohingya out of northern Rakhine and uh, move them to, to Bangladesh. Uh, and, uh, and that, of course, is deeply problematic because the country you worry about a, a broader confessional um, uh, confrontation existing beyond Rakhine. And then also, as we have long warned, that unless they dealt with the fundamental issues, it would be a magnet uh, for extremism. The other worris worrisome thing the other day we saw is that uh, the extremist uh, Buddhist monk Wiratu uh, was unmuzzled. He'd been muzzled for about a year, and he was, um, uh, he basically, I mean, he, was, he said things you couldn't even say in public. I mean, just so extreme. Uh, but also we saw on some of the extremists uh, from the other side, the sort of the jihadist networks, uh, you know, very hard, you know, uh, rhetoric, and, and it, it has all the makings of a colossal crisis uh, that can extend ec elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia unless we uh, end the uh, military operations now. Uh, and uh, we have to contrive a, a number of different uh, mechanisms by which we could do this with the help of, and I know the Secretary General has been um, making calls to various regional leaders, uh, because if we don't stop the killing, uh, then we are in a, in a very bad space. Um, and so uh, this could just be the opening chapters of something far worse, of course. I want to open it up to a wider conversation in just a second. But one last question to try to be a little bit more uplifting. I mean, we've talked yeah. a lot already about some of the negative trend lines and some of the particularly ugly cases of repression and denial of human rights around the world. But do you see instances where you see possibilities of reversing some of those negative trend lines, whether it's because of changes in leadership or external influences or anything else? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first <laughs> point, I think, Bill, is that we do get depressed. I think almost by nature, human rights people are sort of almost sort of sullen. They have a very sensitive sort of um, uh, antenna when it comes to injustice, and so you feel it. Uh, uh, but what's also extraordinary is the, the courage of human rights defenders around the world. I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing. And I, I say this all the time because it needs to be said. Because we like to think ourselves as people who could be courageous. But if you're told point blank that you stand to lose everything, uh, I mean everything, your family, your, your livelihood, uh, if you were to publish an article, or you were to take a position where you were criticizing a government's performance. Uh, I mean, many of us would think twice, right? You would have to think about it. And the fact that there are people who will nevertheless stand up, speak, knowing that next year, next day they would be in prison, it's mind-blowing because there's so many who actually do it. You know, there's so many of the most amazing, courageous people who actually do it. Um, and what we like to see is that if there is a change in government, we always want to try and test and see where we see a potential for change. Uh, and so Uzbekistan uh, stands to mind. Uh, I'll be seeing uh, President uh, Mirza Yoyev tomorrow. I went to visit him in uh, Tashkent a few months ago. Uh, I, I, over a year ago, Uzbekistan would have, been, would have ranked as one of the most repressive countries. And, uh, a country with, with which we had enormous difficulty. And uh, the former president passed away. We have a new president who clearly, we believe now, is opening up the country in the, in the right direction. It's by no means perfect, and there are many violations which we would still cite. But we feel that this is a, a transitional moment that we want to try and, and help them with. And so that, that is encouraging. And it's, some, it's, it's, um, and it's conditions like that that... Uh, that keep us optimistic. Thanks. Well, as I said, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So let me open it up now to your questions. There'll be microphones that'll come to you. If you just raise your hand, once you get the microphone, please identify yourself. Um, please try to be concise and end with a question mark. We have about a half an hour, I think. So yes, sir. Mike's right behind you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. High Commissioner. My name is Engadu. I represent the Ethiopian Satellite Television and Radio based in Washington, D.C., London, and Amsterdam. It's formed by exiled journalists uh, for the obvious reasons. We can't work from there. Um, 
Mr. High Commissioner, you visited Ethiopia um, yeah. in May after a deadly protest uh, in which by the government's own admission, 669 people were killed. And um, among other things, you demanded an in independent investigation into, into the killings and also for the uh, perpetrators to be brought to justice. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> your, your staff has been, uh, have been denied access from your statement in June. And um, none of your demands have been met by the government. And in fact, in Ethiopia, the human rights situation has worsened since, since you visited that country. Um, uh, recent reports show that there, is, there has been an ethnic uh, clashes going on in the eastern part uh, in which the government is allegedly uh, armed both sides, the Somalis and the Oromos. And um, uh, there is obviously a human rights crisis in Ethiopia while the international community is looking the other way. Uh, what, what, what is your office going to do um, amid all this crisis and uh, we feel for that country. Um, thank you very much, sir. Mm. Very good. So do you want me to respond right here? Please. Okay. Uh, the, when I visited Ethiopia, I made, uh, uh, made it clear that I wanted to uh, sit down and speak to one of the leaders um, of uh, the movement which created uh, a, a sense of crisis in Ethiopia, but the crisis goes back and has the antecedents that you are very well aware of. And I was driven to uh, a remand center where I spent 40 minutes uh, with one of the principal leaders of the opposition. And uh, the opposite, I mean, the, let's say the opposition which falls uh, outside, of the, uh, outside of the coalition. And uh, we had a long talk. And uh, in my subsequent discussions with the leadership of the country, yes, absolutely, you're right. I asked uh, for access for my people to Oromo and Amhara. And uh, we were not given that access. I intend to go back in January, where I hope they will give me personally, plus my team, access uh, to those areas. Um, and we need to... There, is, there are signs that there could be openings in the country. I think there is enough of awareness that over the last two years, the country could not maintain itself along the current sort of trajectory. And that unless there was an opening up of the system and, an, and the ability for people to exercise their civil and political rights uh, more openly, uh, the country was imperiled. I was uh, quite encouraged by a discussion between uh, the opposition outside the coalition and uh, a member of the, of the uh, ruling party, where it was so raw, it was so heated. I mean, I had never seen anything like it. I mean, it was genuinely passionate arguments against uh, being used against one another. So my hope is that this is a country that, can, that we can nudge in that direction, uh, notwithstanding the, the, the problems that it really faces, and uh, I'm very aware of it. Um, but I will form a more conclusive op opinion and picture after my trip in January, and then, uh, and then we'll see. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much. Abdullah Hasan, the Globe Post. Uh, I'm from Turkey. Uh, the Globe Post is a DC-based new media outlet. I would like to ask you about Turkey, the ongoing crankdown. Uh, you know all the details, 50,000 people jailed, and there's a massive crackdown on media. But there's also another far disturbing element in this story, which is largely gone unnoticed. Uh, only the New York Times magazine reported about it. 17,000 women and nearly 700 babies also jailed. Uh, for instance, 200 women just after they delivered a baby in a hospital, the police waited outside and took them into jail. This is, you know, just gone crazy. I, I would like to know your opinion about it. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, and uh, uh, last week, I, uh, going back to uh, Bill's point about the internal, external consistency, I, I made a point that the Turkish leadership has wanted to play on the global stage in a very active way, and so has called for a ministerial meeting in New York uh, on the plight of the Rohingya, which I welcomed. But I also noted that, as you said, uh, uh, Turkey itself has enormous uh, human rights challenges. Half the world's journalists imprisoned are, are in Turkey. Uh, the uh, attack on various uh, Kurdish and leftist uh, communities has been very pronounced. Um, and uh, not all of it can be excused, as so many governments try to explain to us on a charge of uh, or a suspicion of counterterrorism. And, and this is perhaps the most sort of challenging of all the uh, obstacles we face, um, in that uh, if counterterrorism legislation is used as a means of score settling with opposition parties, with civil society that expresses dissent, it actually does a service in the long run to those uh, who are really uh, part of the violent extremist movement because you're turning so much of the public against you eventually. Um, and Turkey is a large country, an important strategic country. Um, uh, quite frankly, I, I don't have a dialogue with the leadership. I wish I did. I have been asking for access to the southeast as well, uh, to Chizre, at Diyarbakir, to Nusaybin for two years. Uh, they have invited me to Ankara. Uh, I have resisted going because I need to have access to the southeast as well. And um, so it's a very complicated relation, a relationship, and we're very worried about Turkey. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, my name is Zahra Sadekpour. I'm with the Women Freedom Forum organization. Uh, we are a research um, organization that have members throughout the universities or professors or deans, etc., throughout the country. And we concentrate on the women and children in the Middle East. Um, my question, I guess, or comments, I'm not sure which uh, you will take it as, um, we have families and friends and members inside Iran as well. And more and more in the last year or so, there has been a huge campaign inside Iran um, that thankfully has come into light and the world is finding out more about it, is the 1988 massacre of 30,000 political prisoners in less than two months. Um, you know, after World War II, the world said it will not happen again. And unfortunately, as you better than any of us know, it has repeated itself throughout the uh, last few decades. The, what we are, um, I guess my question is that what the United Nations can do, your office, any kind of investigational entity independent of, that is not connected to the Iranian regime. As you know, uh, Ms. Asma Jahangir, the Iran's Rapporteur on Human Rights, has submitted a report to the United Nations and Secretary General as well, uh, made a note to the members about the 1988 massacre just recently. Um, the families want to know where their loved ones are buried. For example, a mother, a pregnant, and her husband were, were jailed during the uh, 1980s, and she gave birth. The mother and father both executed. She, the baby at 15 days old was taken away, and there's nowhere to be found. Now the aunt who's asking, hey, you killed my family, you killed my brother, where is my niece or nephew? They don't even know, and she's in jail now, just simply because of asking those things. The moms and parents are dying. They are in old age. That happened 29 years ago. And they all they want to see what's happening. The cemeteries are being bulldozed. They have becoming land landfills now and, and the pretext of uh, you know, parks and concretes to um, cover these mass graves of 1988 that we don't even know how many exactly or what are their names are. Uh, what can be done uh, from the United Nations? Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to tie the response into a lecture I gave at the Law Society in London uh, a few uh, months ago. 
you know, we human beings are fundamentally untrustworthy and unreliable. And for that reason, we have laws. If we were entirely trustworthy and we uh, believed in human, the human capacity to reason and learn from mistakes, then custom alone would suffice. We would have customary law as such, and we wouldn't need to codify laws nationally or internationally. Uh, we're not there yet, and we are not capable in, in many respects in dealing with issues of memory, as we've now seen in, in, in the US for some time, not just the Char events in Charlottesville most recently, but uh, in many parts of the world, the inability to deal with historical injustices uh, is a lament. It's a failure of humankind um, to accept what has happened. And yes, it's subject to interpretation, but the broad uh, contours of it could be elucidated. I think it, it, I, I could be told that I'm wrong because there may be presidential historians here, but I think it, it was Lincoln's sort of desire in April 1865, before he was assassinated, uh, to not cast a glance backward at the enormous uh, bloodletting of the Civil War and to sort of move the country with a partial amnesia at least uh, forward, but then set in train a century and a half of uh, a focus on, on other aspects of human development and leaving these sorts of events behind. I, I must confess, I didn't know about it until I had read about it. And, um, and I need to do my own investigations. I mean, we, we opine on the uh, situation, human rights situation in Iran quite regularly, from the use of the death penalty, of course, in respect of juveniles, uh, those who uh, clearly uh, should not be subject to it under human rights law uh, because they are part of a drug offense and it's not a most serious crime as, as the human rights mechanisms have explained. But also treatment of various minorities, the Baha'i minority stands uh, very clear there. And we have issues regarding arbitrary detention as well. This is an issue which I, I'm, I thank you for raising it because I, I do need to sit there and study it. And uh, what we do realize is if you're a victim of any serious human rights violation, the temporal space, I mean, in countries there may be a statute of limitations in respect of what legal action can be taken. But in the emotional space, the suffering is as immediate as when it first happened. And I've seen this time and again. Uh, I most, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was in Sri Lanka, uh, where a lady who had been uh, raped multiple times 30 years ago was in tears for 40 minutes. And her pain was as immediate as it was the minutes after she had been raped. So people's suffering is, uh, is not erased just simply by the passage of time, uh, unless we, we tend to it. So I, I thank you for raising this issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right, right behind you. Good morning. My name is Tom Getman. Thank you, Mr. High Commissioner, for visiting with us. And thank Sheppy and Mort for your service now and always. Um, I was on the OCHA board as the ICFA chairman in Geneva, and therefore the representative, one of the NGO representatives to the High Commission. <clears throat> and uh, I'm taking a delegation to Palestine and to Jordan of 30 people in October, and I'm wondering what we can do, if anything, what you can do or we can do together to help uh, with the restrictions against humanitarian activities and um, advocacy activities in regard to Israel-Palestine? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, uh, Roy. I mean, I myself had been wanting to go to the region, but, um, you know, as I've noticed, or I noticed very quickly, when I first uh, was elected to this position, uh, every government was extending invitations for me to visit. And then as, as I began to speak, each invitation is sort of, you know, I, they can't make it at this time. I, the, too, the schedule is too busy. Um, and so we have a very active office uh, in Ramallah. And we have a presence in the Middle East. Um, and uh, clearly we see restrictions, you know, on uh, the civil society space. 
And uh, much of it is uh, sort of, if you look and trace back, uh, let's say a good deal of it stems from um, the, the sort of, it's modeled on the Russian foreign agents law and the uh, undesirable associations law. And, uh, and so the, the restrictions over the long term do tremendous damage to these sort of nascent democracies or at least democracies that uh, present themselves as being uh, valiant champions of, of the uh, right to free speech and freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly and, and so forth. Um, it is a discussion that uh, requires, I think, fortitude and just persistence. And eventually, the, we might get a, a fortuitous moment where we can reverse some of this. Uh, but the ethno-nationalism that is now running rife throughout the world um, it poses enormous uh, dangers because uh, there's this remarkable exchange that I've cited quite a, a number of times between a psychologist, uh, Gustav uh, Gilbert, um, an American psychologist who sat with uh, Hermann Goering in Nuremberg and was taking his testimony. And Goering said, you know, it's very easy to mobilize people. You just tell them they're under attack internally and from within and from without. And anyone who says anything that runs contrary to this is labeled a, a traitor and treacherous. And before you know it, you have a very malleable public. And it was so brazen in the way he said it. And he was being challenged by Gilbert, but Goering stuck to it. And, uh, and ultimately, you worry that throughout the world, as civil society is crushed, and independent, independent media is driven into the far recesses of, a, of society where it can't express itself, as Bill was saying, we're in, in another space. And we've been in that space before. You know, we've been in the, the pre sort of June 28, 1914 space before. And uh, I, I just can I do a little run on, on a thought here? So we had this discussion a few um, weeks ago about. Uh, the power of some of the major uh, internet companies. And uh, I asked whether or not, and because it's ha it has been written about the possibility of a splinter net, whether or not it's entirely possible that the internet can just suddenly disappear one day. And the argument being that prior to June 28, 1914, if you had asked any uh, ship owner any trader, any banker in Europe, and indeed, actually, this was written about in this wonderful book, 1913, where in, in the middle of 1913, there was an article which reflected uh, the contents of a book written in 1910, saying that it's simply impossible that there can be a European, a general European war, because there's so many uh, stakeholders that have a stake in peace, they simply would not allow it to happen. So the argument that all our lives are so dependent on the internet, we won't allow it to fail is a flawed argument because we have, as humanity, broken this world already twice and we can break it again. And uh, the, the, the read holding all of this together is very tenuous. And, so, and the rights part of it is the most delicate, the most sensitive uh, uh, sort of antenna that we have. And if you don't pay attention to it, you know, the, the, uh, the collapse can come pretty quickly. And that's why we are so doggedly pushing for it. <laughs> you have to smuggle me through. You need a long overcoat. Maybe I'll hide inside or something. Please. Hi. Microphone's on its way. Thank you. Hi, Elisa Massimino with Hi, Human Rights First. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, High Commissioner, for your leadership, uh, not just for being here with us today, but it's been truly a bright spot for all of us who work on human rights um, and continues to be. Um, as you know, I work for an organization whose mission is to foster, encourage, um, and leverage American global leadership on human rights, <laughs> <laughs> which... Uh, um, we're, we're now expanding what it means, uh, what American leadership means uh, to include beyond the U.S. government um, and all Americans. But uh, I'm curious uh, um, if you could speak a little bit more about 
any relationships that you have, the, the character and content of the relationships that you have now with Ambassador Haley and, and her staff uh, and anybody here in Washington. And then if you have any advice for us uh, as civil society organizations based here in the United States uh, who have this as our mission. Thanks. And this is not going to disclose that we had a breakfast not long ago where <laughs> you weren't going to say that. Um, I had two discussions with Ambassador Haley, uh, both very polite, cordial. We discussed a number of different <coughs> files externally, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Burundi, uh, for example. And we discussed the Human Rights Council. I didn't feel that there was any tension, notwithstanding comments that I had made about uh, the president and prior to the elections uh, as well. Um, and uh, so it was all, it was all uh, fairly polite. Um, uh, I haven't had any other content, uh, contacts at a high level, at a, a cabinet level, but uh, with uh, members of the State Department I have had. Um, and I, I did notice, and I mentioned it, of course, to Ambassador Burns, because I couldn't help but mention, uh, raise this, that last week at the Human Rights Council, uh, the U.S. Um, statement was really quite surprising because given the relationship that the White House has um, uh, created or the relationships with some of the uh, member states, um, I was surprised to see that they were being uh, cited for human rights violations. Uh, uh, so explicitly, Egypt, Bahrain being two. Uh, so the system seems to be working um, and uh, again, one sort of expects that there would be uh, a sort of slow recalibration and perhaps the initial attempt to push back on, on the human rights agenda writ large will be, will be thought through again. And uh, I suspect also that um, Ambassador Haley's experience in the Security Council has, has uh, changed the way that she views this. I mean, she may have an inbuilt a uh, 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 compass that uh, sort of will direct it to human rights. But you, you cannot s not serve on the, uh, the Security Council and then see how the, the deficits in, in human rights uh, are so intimately involved in the uh, creation of crises. And then of, also they're needed uh, to be settled uh, when you deal with the post-crisis uh, period. So, so I'm hoping that there is a, a change. Um, I haven't op opined as much about the United States as others have asked me to opine because the cacophony of noise, the, the activism, the discussions on all sides uh, still gives you hope that the U.S. can always make adjustments. Um, and it was always said that uh, if there was one problem with Europe is that it couldn't adjust to certain realities in the same way the U.S. Uh, adjusts to them. So uh, we're keeping an eye, um, and where we feel we need to say something, we, we will say something. And we thank you for your leadership as well, Yes, sir. My name is Connie Zulam. I'm with the American Kurdish Information Network and Advocacy Office for the Kurds. Last February, your office issued a report about Turkish armed forces reducing 30 Kurdish towns and city centers into vast parking lots generating close to half a million refugees. They are forgotten now. You are busy with the Rohingya refugees. Will we forget them in six months, time, six months from now? What are good days like in your office? Yeah, no, I, we, um, we are producing periodic reports. Um, on, so every few months, we will produce a report on the Southeast, and we will make it public. The idea being, is that we ask for access to a particular area. It could be northern Rakhine. It could be uh, Jammu Kashmir on both sides of the line of control. It could be Nagorno-Karabakh in all these cases. It could be in Ethiopia, uh, Mozambique, Venezuela, in all these situations where we do not uh, receive uh, uh, the access that we seek. We start off by, we started this policy about a year ago by doing remote monitoring and then sharing the conclusions with the government or governments concerned. And if they still uh, oppose us from uh, securing access, 
we will make those public. And we don't stop. We're not, this is not going to stop until we have some clear idea of what happened in, in detail in, in those regions. Um, a good day comes from the family of someone that we managed to either have released or where the death penalty wasn't uh, imposed and they write to us and you realize it was all worth it. Um, you save a human life, uh, someone wrongfully accused. Now, all the, the insults and the bitterness of governments against us and all human rights defenders is all worth it uh, if we can do, can do that. And, and we do receive, and all of us who are human rights defenders, we receive a lot of abuse. I think what the way we think, though, is rather different. We realize that if you scramble only for your own kind, you scramble it for everyone else. You have to scramble on behalf of humanity writ large. And then you can have a safe humanity. Otherwise, we've seen it time and again. The historical record shows it. Uh, we're down in abyss. And again, going back to the ethno-nationalisms, it's extremely dangerous, and we have, to, we have to claw ourselves away from it. We just have time for a couple of more questions. Let me look in the back. Yes, sir. <laughs> Microphone's right behind you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mariano de Alba. I'm from Venezuela. Uh, thank you, High Commissioner. I just wanted to ask you, two weeks ago, you put out a report denouncing extensive human rights violation and uh, a, a policy to repress political dissent. Uh, now there are, there are efforts in the Organization of American States to try to refer the situation in Venezuela to the International Criminal Court, a court which you played uh, an essential part in establishing. Do you, think, do you think the situation in Venezuela merits a referral to the International Criminal Court? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, we presented our report and then I have since asked for there to be an international investigation uh, mounted. Uh, what our investigation did, we didn't have access to Venezuela, but we spoke to a lot of Venezuelans uh, outside the country, and as you know, many have fled, um, is uh, that we needed to have, our investigation is a human rights investigation. We needed to have the beginnings of, sort of criminal investigations to establish whether indeed there were grounds for believing crimes against humanity have uh, uh, been perpetrated, as we suspect they may have been. And um, uh, whether these investigations are conducted by the ICC or there's a, another body, uh, we believe this is uh, merited. And um, I, I don't know whether I should, I, because we, this was an internal discussion, but we had a discussion within my office about uh, making contact with the OAS. Um, and uh, I, the, our, our report is public, so they must have it but to make sure that they, they did indeed have it. And we're very concerned about Venezuela uh, for obvious reasons. Thanks. Fred, the last question. Let's see. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Then there'll be one more. more. Yeah, after you. Uh, good morning, and thank you, um, High Commissioner, for your insights. And thank you for talking about the crisis um, in Southeast Asia in in Myanmar. Um, I wanted to ask you about another crisis in the same region where more than 12,000 um, people have been killed, including children, um, in the name of, well, drug crime. Um, so that's in the Philippines, um, where now civil society, which used to be one of the most vibrant in Asia, one of the oldest democracies in Asia, has now really cowered, where um, the Commission on Human Rights um, will be in 2018 getting a budget of $20, $20 as passed by um, an overwhelming majority in Congress. Um, Special Rapporteur Calamard has already been having um, a duel, a verbal duel with um, the president's team. But I do wonder, um, and this is my question for you, um, how will um, your office um, come in and sort of help um, move the move the the debate uh, and help address the situation, given that it's really eroding in the country right now. Yeah. Um, the point I, I forgot to mention now, and you've prompted it, uh, is you know, much of what it is that we do depends on a sense of shame. So whether it's you know, Alyssa's uh, you know, uh, group here in, in the United States, or we internationally, shedding light on a particular series of violations, 
that a sense of shame will create a changed behavior. And what do we do when there is no shame? When, when you know, he calls for the bombing of certain schools, uh, uh, when he calls for uh, the killing of people who have not been subjected to uh, judicial remedy or judicial, let's say, due process, sorry. Um, uh, this sense of shame begins to to undo the whole system. And I was worried for that same reason when uh, uh, then candidate and subsequently President Trump would speak of torture in the same way. There's a free hearing that could be entertained in any circumstance, not even when the life of a nation is threatened. Are you permitted to uh, indulge in torture? And so what do we do with a world where the, the, the sense of shame disappears? And uh, we've commented on many, on many occasions about what's happening in the Philippines. And I'm staying in touch with uh, Senator Lima and her defense uh, team, uh, because it is indeed the worry that uh, you uh, set the country, but not just that country, others, on a path to eventual uh, turmoil, uh, because uh, history is replete with where repression ultimately takes you. It takes you through into a very, you know, sort of terrible space, uh, which will then take decades from which one uh, uh, will have to invest enormously before you can emerge from it. And uh, so it's, it, it's painful to see what's happening in the Philippines. Uh, one doesn't claim that one is soft on, on, on crime for standing up for the rights of all people to due process. Where they, you perceive them to be guilty of a particular uh, crime, then clearly then the, the, the law must uh, and the courts must take care of it. But where there is an overambitious and an exaggerated campaign and uh, uh, innocent people are suffering too, and those who are just pointing the fact that injustices may be occurring are then also labeled as, uh, as treacherous almost. Uh, this is, uh, of course, deeply unfortunate. And, uh, and must be reversed. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. What did you have a question? I was going to ask you. Microphone's right there. Here you go. Thank you. What do you consider your most successful effort? Staying alive, I think. <laughs> I, Mort, I, I don't know whether, you know, you, you're bundled from one situation into the other every day. Um, uh, you know, we, the, the office is, uh, we have 66 field presences. Um, uh, we have an amazing staff. Um, and for all the young people here who are looking for a career, you can't find a more meaningful life than to be involved in human rights and humanitarian work. Um, and uh, the inspiration from them is, uh, is enormous. And all credit must be given to them because, you, again, you go to the most uh, hard-pressed, conflict-ridden parts of the world and you see these amazing young people uh, put themselves in harm's way. And, and it, I find it, frankly, really irritating when people attack the UN. Look, I, I'm not going to defend the endless, long, and boring meetings in New York that we have to endure. That's why I fled New York today to come down and be here <laughs> and be, be with you in, in honor of you and Shetty. Um, but what irritates me is when those who have never been in the field, who have not been in conflict areas, you know, sort of portray the UN as this flabby, this sort of useless organization. Well, you tell that to the people working in the southeast of the Central African Republic in the most unbelievable conditions. And uh, how long would you be able to last there if you were a detractor of the UN? Would you be able to last a few weeks and uh, with this sort of violence that takes place? And so I think a sense of proportion and a sense of decency about all of this is required. Um, I, it's difficult for me to put my finger on a single thing that I, I can be proud of. But I think I'm, I'm, I, I'm proud of just being part of this movement and part of this uh, office. So I, I sort of dodged the question a little bit. Well, I, I hate to bring fascinating conversations to a close, but Zaid, I think you've actually given us lots of reminders of why we're proud to have you in the role that you're in, reminders of the breadth and depth of the challenges that all of us face in human rights around the world today. Um, 
a reminder of the thoughtfulness and commitment and eloquence that you bring to the task, and again, a reminder of why we're so lucky to have you in that role. So once again, Mord and Sheppy, thanks so much for making this series possible. Thank you. Thank you.